Only a few hours and it's time to unwrap the Christmas gifts. One gift I can't wait to see is this one here. So I'm going to unwrap it right now to let you have a first look at the all new Silverhead booster. Hello everyone and welcome to the IOTT channel. I am Hans Tanner. A special welcome to all first time visitors and welcome back to everyone else. I'm happy to see you and wish you and your family a Merry Christmas, plenty of time to play with the trains between the days and a happy and prosperous new year. Thank you for your support of this channel in the ending year and I'm looking forward to see you coming back for more videos in 2024. So here it is. Before I power it up, let's have a quick look what's inside. At the bottom is an Arduino Uno. A Mega would work as well, but I prefer the smaller form factor of the Uno. Next comes two power shield boards to generate the track output. Up to six can be stacked on the same Arduino, and each of them is good for five or even eight amps of track current. On top of the power shields is a DCC AUX shield, which powers the Arduino and provides the connection to the IoTT stick. And finally, there is a Tinkerface shield to connect the DCC input and optionally lock on it. The growth port of the Tinkerface shield is wired to the growth input of the IoTT stick, so that the stick can either receive DCC or lock on it input. As usual, I use the IOTT cube frames as enclosure for the entire stack. It makes it look nice and more importantly, the frames support the individual shields and hold them in the right position and distance to the neighbor shields. Now, that was a very quick overview and there is a lot more to talk about. I will do that in upcoming videos, so if you are interested, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you are among the first to know when new videos are released. To power the booster up, I connect a 12 volt DC power supply to the barrel connector of the DCC AUX shield. Alternatively, the stack can also be powered from one of the booster boards. Then I load the IP address of the stick in a web browser to configure the booster. The web interface is the easiest way to configure, but the booster also supports JSON commands via the serial port of the Arduino, or Loconet SV commands, but that again is a topic for a future video. In the node configuration, select Loconet or DCC interface as command source, depending on your DCC system, and Silverhead as the head module. If you want, you can also give it a meaningful name that you then can use in the web browser. I find this easier than using the IP address. The Silverhead page has three subtabs. The first is for the hardware configuration, the second is for setting up the software options, and the third is to control the booster at runtime. Open the Hardware Configuration tab and start by selecting the number of booster modules you have in the stack. In my case, as we have seen, it is two. The screen will then display a configuration line for each booster. For each booster you now enter the I.O. pins according to the physical power shield settings. The DCC input must always be on pins 2 and 3, so there is nothing to configure here but you must specify the pin number of the power pin and the analog pin used for current sensing. Note that all configuration can be done in the screen dialog. There is no need to change the source code of the Arduino program. If the power shield you are using supports polarity reversing, you can also enter the pin number to control the output polarity. Note that polarity reversing is supported starting with PowerShield Revision 5. Another topic for a future video. 
Next, enter the sensor rate. For standard power shields, this is 8.31. For the Revision 5 power shield, the value is 12.2. Revision 5 and any future boards have the sensor rate value printed on the board, and it is the same value you use for the power shield board in a DCC-X stack. The only remaining item is measuring the short circuit current, which depends on the track supply voltage and the total resistance of your track system. To measure, click the measure button, which will switch off the track power. Then make contact between the two rails somewhere on the layout. It is best to create this short circuit as far from the track feeder as possible, so that the lowest possible short circuit current is measured. Click OK to start the process. The booster will now switch track power on for about 500 microseconds and then measure the booster current and display it. It is, by the way, a good idea to repeat this test once in a while, particularly after making changes to the layout or the power supply. Knowing the short circuit current is important to determine what current the booster can supply during regular operations. This nominal current will be set in the Options tab. But before we do that, it is best to click the Save to EEPROM button and save the settings in the non-volatile booster memory. The Options tab has two parts. In the top section are the configurations for the entire booster. The lower part has settings that are specific for each booster channel. Select DCC as valid signal format and on or off for the track status at power up. Then activate the use command communication checkbox if you want the booster to respond to commands from the command station. If activated, additional options are displayed. The first is a command to switch the track output on and off. If the booster is connected to DCC, you can use any switch or signal command. When connected to LocoNet, you can also use block detector input and button commands. Note that on and off can use different command types and addresses. In the example shown, I used turnout 25 to switch the track power on and off, so the booster reacts from commands entered in my throttle and turns all track outputs on or off. Now we need to set the nominal output current for each booster board. Based on the measured short circuit current, the booster makes a recommendation for a safe maximum value. In the case of my first booster, the measured short circuit current is 11.7 amps and the recommendation for the nominal current is not more than 8.2 amps, so there is enough room between regular operation and short circuit detection. For this test I don't need that much, so I set it to 3.5 amps. Note that this value is the current that the booster is set to deliver continuously, not just the peak value that makes it trip. The latter is calculated internally and is set to 135% of the nominal value. If you have configured an auto-reversing pin in the hardware setup, you get the auto-reverse checkbox. If you activate it, the booster will try to change the output polarity in case of a short circuit before it shuts down. This allows for a short circuit based auto reversing section. Next, select the reset model, either auto reset, limited auto reset, or manual reset after the short circuit. Watch video number 118 for the differences of these methods. Last in this section, set the fuse mode from slow to fast. It determines how fast the booster is to react in case of a short circuit and how much overloading is tolerated before an overtemperature shutdown occurs. In the actuator settings section, you can specify more commands to make the booster react to external inputs, but this time the settings are only valid for this particular booster channel. Again, there are commands for setting the track power on and off, then a command for resetting the booster after a short circuit, if it is not set to full auto reset. And if you have configured a polarity reversing pin, you also get 
command options to remotely set the booster polarity in one or the other direction. Finally, in the reporting settings section, you can specify commands that the booster sends out in case of a short circuit or an overload situation. That makes it possible to display the booster status on a CTC panel or to trigger an alarm in case of a short circuit and similar things. Note that these options are only available if the booster is connected to Loconet, which provides for bidirectional communication. And that is all to the setup. Again, click Save to EEPROM to store all these settings in the EEPROM of the Arduino, so that they will be reloaded after a restart. The Monitor tab is also split in a top section for the entire device, and a lower section for the status monitoring of each individual booster channel. The first line displays the quality of the input signal. If you disconnect the DCC input, this will change to no input, and the booster shuts down the track outputs immediately. If the booster is connected to Loconet, you get a set of buttons to set the power status of the command station to on, off or idle. Note that this only indirectly affects the booster output. If you click on stop, the command station shuts down the DCC signal and that in turn makes the booster to shut down too because there is no input. Then there are two buttons to set all outputs of this booster stack to on or off. In the section below you find the status display control inputs for each booster channel, starting with the amp meter. It displays the booster current in milliamps. The color zones indicate the range the booster is operating in. The nominal current is right at the border between the yellow and the light red section. Yellow means high load and starts at 80% of the nominal current. The light red section marks the acceptable temporary overload and goes up to 120% of the nominal current. It is ok to operate in this zone, but the booster will go into overload shutdown after a while. How long it takes depends on the fuse mode settings and the current amount. The dark red zone is sort of a safety buffer and the border between dark red and grey indicates the short circuit trip current. The needle of course displays the actual track current, which is also shown in the numeric display. The booster status is also shown in the status section. Track status indicates what the output is supposed to be, either stop or running. Booster status reflects the internal status. If everything is ok, it shows running, but it also can indicate short circuit or waiting for reset, depending on the selected reset model. Load factor shows the thermal status of the booster. If it goes to over 120%, the booster will go in a cooldown mode until the load factor is back to 60%. If a reverse polarity pin is defined, the last line shows the polarity of the auto reverse output. The buttons in the output control section are used to control the booster from the web interface. Toggle power switches the track output. Reset is used to clear a short circuit in manual reset mode. And toggle AR is used to manually change the polarity of the output. This button only shows if a reverse output pin is configured. Let's do a quick demonstration. For this test I am setting up three adjacent sections. The middle section is powered from the auto-reversing booster channel. The two outer sections are wired to the same booster channel but with different track polarity. As a result, when the locomotive travels from sector 1 to sector 3, the polarity of the middle section must be changed or a short circuit will occur when the locomotive bridges between two sections. First, a quick demonstration of the short circuit modes. I have one district in manual reset, the other in auto reset mode. If I create a short circuit in the manual reset section, the booster immediately shuts down and displays the short circuit status. When set to auto reset, it keeps trying 
although the interval between two tests is getting longer. As soon as the short circuit is removed, the track power status is restored. In the manual section, I need to click the reset button to restore the track power. Next, I drive the locomotive from section A to section C. As the locomotive moves, the current it draws is displayed on the amp meter. When it crosses the gap, the current draw goes from one amp meter to the other. When it crosses the second gap, the same happens and we see also that the polarity of the middle section changes as the wheels of the locomotive create a short circuit when hitting the rails with opposite polarity. Let's watch it again going in the other direction. This time there is no polarity change at the first gap as the polarity of the middle section is still the one of section C. But when I cross into section A, the polarity of section B is reversed again to match the one from section A. Now let's repeat that run, but this time I manually toggle the polarity while the locomotive is in the middle of section B. So I click the toggle AR button and when the locomotive now enters section C, the polarity is already correct and no short circuit happens. The same I do on the way back and keep in mind, instead of me clicking the toggle AR button, the same could be achieved by a block detector or optical sensor and the booster could adjust the polarity automatically based on train movements or even the position of the turnout leading into the reversing loop. And this concludes this little initial demo. Oh, did I already mention there will be more videos in the future covering setup, configuration and operation of the booster in more detail. I am now working to make the PowerShield Revision 5 and the Tinkerface board available in the Tindy store, which probably will take about a month until the components are available. At that time I will also make the booster software available on the GitHub page and release a new IoT stick software version with support for the Silverhead booster. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and you have an idea now what the Silverhead booster can do. As always, please let me know your thoughts in the comment section and click the like button below. It only takes a second to do so, but it helps a long way to support the IoTT channel in general and to promote this video to other model railroaders because YouTube likes the likes. Thanks for watching and see you in the first video of the next year.